thanks for uh, sticking around so late. Um, so this is the uh, getting started session for how to code, how to do 3D maps with the JavaScript API. Uh, my name is Joe, and this is Arno. Uh, we're both from the R&D center in Zurich, where the 3D part of the JavaScript API is developed. Um, if you want, you can already access this presentation with this link here, uh, but it'll be available um, later as well, of course. Um, yeah, there's quite a bit of code in this presentation, and if you're having trouble reading the text in the back, may I just ask you please to come closer a little bit? Um, but you'll see. Uh, all right, well, let's get started. So, the goal, or yeah, I mean, this is the, the, the demo that I've shown in the plenary today or this morning, and I guess this is what we're what we're trying to achieve here in the end, we're not going step by step of how you would achieve this exact app because there's a lot of code around making, you know, the application work in a kind of JavaScript, HTML kind of sense. It would be a bit too complex. But most of the pieces that you would need from the JavaScript API to create this app is, is in this presentation if you just put it, put it together the right way. So, yeah, I mean, this is loading different layers from online. It moves the camera around when the user clicks on, on certain things. We make these transitions from one area to the next. We, as we do this, you, you may see at the building change the color so you can restyle these things. Um, there's uh, interactive elements, there's pop-ups. I don't know, this one I may not have pop-ups, but uh, yeah. Uh, so this is really the goal and uh, what I like about this sample specifically is actually I think it's the first demo that we made that is more of a website rather than an application, right? So this is this is kind of shows that any website that or many websites can be enriched with WebGL and with our API uh, allowing or giving the user interactive content. So let's look at how this is done. Actually before we start, um, I just want to want to say this session is about writing JavaScript and HTML. So this is really like getting down and, and, and coding and writing applications. There are many other ways in which you can create um, user experiences and also interactive user experiences without actually doing any coding. So there's first of all there's the scene viewer, which is the the application that opens when you in ArcGIS Online click on any 3D data set, it'll open up. And that one already allows uh in certain or that may already be enough for certain cases when you just want to show a data set, you can send out the link to, to the scene viewer. Um then there's story maps, which is a, a more focused version of that that allows you to tell a story alongside with your scene and kind of guide the user through your story. Um oh, maybe I could show briefly show uh an example of that. I don't know, actually, don't know that one. I didn't test it, so let's see what happens. Uh, story maps can combine 2D and 3D maps as well in any kind of content like video, but as we scroll down in this story map, we expect to see some maps at some point, like right here. Um, so that's another way, or that's one way. Uh, and then there's the web app builder, which is which starts out as a kind of like a click and play application builder if you don't know it. So you can pick which widgets that you want and, and, and how your app should look like. You can easily just like, if you have a web scene, you can easily create a customized version with, with your name on it, with your logo on it uh, of that website and then yeah, add things in as you want. You can pick data, you can pick functionality and then you can share it. <coughs> so the reason I'm going through this is because when you, when you want to create some user experience, um, before you start and do everything by yourself, you should think about what do I really need and maybe there's a, an easy way how I can get to that, uh, an easier way than writing a, a full application. But this session is about if you want full flexibility, full customizability, <coughs> then uh, that's what this session is about. Uh, secondly, doing 3D in a browser has some requirements on the machine and this is somehow, this is sometimes a bit tricky to balance for the, uh, for the app developer. Uh, luckily by now we have like pretty good support in terms of browsers. So any modern browser like the newest version of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, uh, Edge will uh, support it, is supported. I, Internet Explorer is supported uh, starting the version 11. 
you will find that some browsers work better than others and that may have an influence like if you know that you have to develop for an older browser like IE 11 you may have to scale down a little bit on the contents that you have. There's uh in the in the next session in the beyond the basics session that's tomorrow evening uh we actually have a slot on performance and how to you know structure your data and and work with there's some things you can do in the app to make it run faster or or make it look better essentially there's kind of a trade off there. Um yeah on mobile devices uh, since last year we support officially support the latest Samsung and the latest Apple devices both tablet and phones. This doesn't mean it doesn't work on any others that's just a set that we test and we ensure that it it works. But most of the modern Android devices will work or I would say all of them and and same for iPhone like you can use older iPhones it's just yeah no guarantees. Um if you're on a desktop then we highly recommend using dedicated graphics cards so that means if that doesn't mean much to you there's uh, you probably know like Nvidia and AMD make these graphics chips that sit alongside your CPU and do nothing but 3D and that really allows you to to have fast performance and everything. It works perfectly uh on Intel integrated graphics chips it's just a bit slower and that mean may mean again that if you target an audience that um is using integrated graphics cards like essentially if you target everyone then you may you you may want to test it on these kind of integrated chips and make sure that your data is actually handleable by by those machines. All right. So enough of the boring chat. Oh, okay. One more <laughs> boring chat slide. The agenda what we're doing uh the first section is going to be the very basics um what does it mean to create a a, a map with a with the 4x API uh, specifically in 3D then we're going to talk about how do you add data to it how can you visualize the data how can you inter or how can the user interact with the data and create interactive experiences and finally uh, I'll introduce the concept of the web scene cool so let's get started first i would like to show the simplest possible app that you can make um with the javascript API and that's this here so let let's run through the code briefly. There's some HTML, obviously, uh title. Um but the JavaScript specific part starts here. So you have to include two things. One is the, the CSS of the JavaScript API, and then the other one is the script tag, which imports all of the code of the JavaScript API. Um and then the next step uh is to start first loading some module. So this is using this require, it's using the AMD module loading syntax. Uh perhaps you know, you're familiar with it um from 3x as well. Uh essentially this tells the app that we're needing um uh, two modules here, the map and the CMU and we get we're getting access to that by by them being passed into the function through these parameters. Um okay and then we instantiate a map and we instantiate a scene view and into the scene view we give uh the reference to the map that we've instantiated before and uh the ID of a diff where the map should be drawn in the end. And that's all like this creates this view here so that already gives you a lot right. You get an interactive map the user can zoom in you can also use touch here. Um zoom in explore the world uh there's a few uh widgets up here that are added by default. You can customize these but that can help for example on, on tablets or uh yeah there's a compass here you can click it it'll north you. That's kind of the default setup um that comes out of it. And with a few very easy steps you can already customize that. For example we could uh choose that we want a different base map. So the instead of the satellite we want the topographic base map. Just change that here and then we'll get that base map. One thing you may have noticed before with the satellite is that the earth was flat and in 3D that's not so cool. So the next very simple step is that we specify that we want to have some elevation in here, some terrain. Uh that should be world elevation. Um so if you specify ground equals world elevation, we will use the default ESRI uh um a terrain 3D service. Um that gives you worldwide coverage for terrain. Uh you can customize that, you can add in your own elevation if you need better better resolution, but this is always like the base map is a good starting point. Um yeah, so these are kind of the very basics. 
let's switch back to theory like uh, what the yeah, how does this work? What does map? What does scene view mean? So first of all, yeah, out of the box you get the, the 3D rendering, you get the user interaction, you get base maps to work with, and you get uh, terrain. So uh, let me briefly describe what is the map and what is the scene view. If you're coming from a 3X, you will be familiar with the map. And moving to 4X, we've made a decision to split that in a kind of a model view pattern sense, if you know that. Um, so the map is still the place where you put all your layers and put all your data down. So as you bring data into your map, you add it to the map here. So th the map describes the content of what you're going to show. Whereas the view, and in the 3D case that's a scene view, that uh, renders the map and it handles user interaction. And really the main reason for us to, to, to uh, make the split and split up the map into two parts is to allow our API to support both 2D and 3D in a unified kind of fashion. Because the map is universal. It doesn't change, it doesn't matter whether you do 2D or 3D, it's always, it's the same class and you add the same kind of data in there mostly, there's always exceptions. Um, but what decides whether you get a 2D map or a 3D map is whether you instantiate a map view or a scene view. I can briefly show that. Uh, I have another uh, small sample here. So this is doing a bunch of stuff. It's already adding a layer and that's a vector tile layer in this case. And here, as you can see, we instantiate, so we also create the map. This is where the layer is being added down here. We'll see more about that later. Uh, but instead of a scene view, here we instantiate a map view, which means this is a 2D map now. I cannot tilt it um, because it's rendered in 2D. But all we need to do to make that a 3D map is we ex essentially exchange uh, map view with scene view in these three locations here. And then refresh. And then you will get a 3D map loading the same data, focused on the same um, locations. And if you had interactions, uh, most of those user interactions would work the same in 2D and in 3D. So there's kind of an easy way to switch between 2D and 3D. If you have a 2D um, app and you would like to switch it to 3D. So this is the main reason why there is a split between the map and the scene view and why we make this kind of model view architecture out of our API. Um, yeah, and again, whenever you want to work with the data, that's typically on a map. Whenever you want to define the view and you want to interact with the user, that's typically on the, the map view or the scene view. All right, so I hand it over to Arno. Yep, so at <coughs> this point, before for diving into the details, we'd like to uh, quickly point out where you can get more information. So the place to start is uh, definitely the developer. Uh, portal developers.arcgis.com slash javascript. Um, you will, uh, we can quickly show that online. Uh, this is a great page here with um, uh, definitely the guide uh, describing uh, different concepts of the API, how, uh, how you can work uh, with it, uh, combining um, different JavaScript technologies such as uh, TypeScript or um, yeah, building frameworks, NPM Webpack is uh, listed here. And uh, general concepts within, within the, the API like uh, accessors, um, which is more of an advanced topic. Um, there's a very detailed documentation of all the classes and methods, uh, properties you have, so you can uh, basically find anything um, you need on this page here and uh, yeah Joe has already uh, showed us the, uh, uh, the uh, what is it called? <laughs> Sandbox, thank you. <laughs> um, where you can basically uh, update live uh, samples and uh, try out new things directly in the browser. So we, we try to create an SDK sample for every feature that we add so I mean, the API reference, as Arno said, is very detailed, gives you all the detail, but as a first stop when you're wondering about, oh, I want to deal with that kind of data, I suggest always uh, check out the, the SDK sample. It's typically very simple snippets, but you can, in the samples, directly modify them, play around with them, get a feeling for them. 
This page is currently getting a uh, redesign, so basically in a few uh, days <clears throat> it will look like this. I think if you go by the booth, uh, they already have this uh, online, so you can have a closer look there. Um, yeah, we already mentioned the sandbox. Um, this is uh, great if you if you try it out, um, not only for for trying out local changes, but um, if you do have, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have tried something out and you kind of want to take it further or even share it with someone else, um, there's this uh, share functionality which basically takes you to CodePen and uh, you can further work on it here, save it, and obviously share it uh, simply by, by the link up in the, in the browser uh, window. Um, I can also recommend uh, the GitHub page of Esri, so github.com slash Esri. Um, there's a bunch of example apps uh, there. I think we will have uh, a look at some of those uh, towards, towards the end of the presentation. So let's um, dive into a few, few of the basics. Um, so first, first topic to start with is definitely uh, adding data, so we've uh, seen how you can basically create a, an, an empty uh, scene view showing uh, basic uh, base maps or uh, elevation data. Um, the first thing you would probably want to do from there is uh, add some sort of data to your scene. Um, we'll start with a very simple tile layer, so this is um, a raster data we're adding uh, to a 3D map, uh, something you would could also use in a, in a 2D map, obviously. It works in a 3D map. Uh, in this example here, we're looking at New York, and um, this tile layer basically gives us uh, the housing density uh, across New York City. Uh, you see it's um, basically draped onto the ground, uh, onto, this, uh, onto the ground in the 3D uh, scene. Um, <clears throat> at this point, it's... Um, Good to point out that there's basically two ways to reference uh, backend data. Um, so when we add this tile layer here um, to to our to our map, uh, we basically instantiate the, um, uh, an object of a type tile layer, and we can either provide it the location, the the URL of the service where we uh, where we can then fetch these map tiles. Um, a second possibility is, is referencing the portal item directly uh, through the ID. Now these two pieces of information, if you uh, are familiar with uh, the online, ArcGIS online, um, then this is basically the entry of the layer we just added. Uh, you can search for any other layer here through the search functionality. Um, but uh, the, the two ways of adding this layer is basically either taking the ID you have up here in the, in the URL of the browser, um, so you can copy paste it there, or you have the service URL uh, at the bottom right here, uh, which you can copy and just uh, add it that way. Um, so what you also see here in this example is that um, we, we do have types. Um, we've also seen that before when um, loading, uh, loading the different JavaScript modules. So the whole API is, is, uh, comes as a, a JavaScript module, um, but we also have TypeScript types. So if you do prefer to work in TypeScript, you can basically take advantage of, uh, of a statically typed um, uh, development environment. Yeah, so we covered that one. Um, another example, or next example, would be uh, a feature layer. Um, so <clears throat> and if a feature layer, layer basically provides uh, geometries which we can add to our scene view. We're still uh, looking at Manhattan in this example. And uh, the feature layer that we're adding here is basically a, a bunch of points. Uh, containing information about popular buildings in uh, New York. This uh, feature layer um, comes with uh, a few 
uh, attributes. Uh, for example, the year the building was um, built or uh, the height of it. Um, we do, um, when creating the feature layer, we basically specify what um, labels or what attributes we want to load from this feature uh, layer. In, in this case, it's the name, uh, yeah, the, the construction year and the height. And uh, by adding it, we also get um, the functionality of, of selecting uh, one of those points and showing showing the attributes in a, in a pop-up. So this is uh, this is uh, what you basically get by the few lines of code we see here on the left side. And you can heavily customize that pop-up. You can make it show images. You can make it show anything you want. Uh, this is done with the pop-up template, but we're not looking at that in detail in this session. Are we looking at that in the Beyond, beyond no. Basics? No, not in that one either. Yeah. Pop-ups are quite uh, uh, extensive, what you can do with them. Um, yeah, that's all. <clears throat> um, another example um, where we get closer to a real uh, 3D, um, or uh, this actually is a sp specific uh, 3D data type, uh, uh, layer type, is uh, the scene layer. Um, in this example here, we're uh, adding a bunch of buildings um, to the scene that we have uh, here. Um, this is um, a scene layer that uh, contains uh, buildings of New York. Um, they are openly available, so you can use that scene layer in any app you build yourself. Uh, build yourself, the, I, I guess the government or uh, the government of New York basically provides this uh, data. Um, now, the, the, the issue we have here, obviously, is that everything is, is quite white. Uh, we have a gray base map. We have gray buildings. Um, we're going to try to improve that uh, uh, in, a, in, the next, uh, in the next step. But um, in the meanwhile, Joe is going to Tell us a little more about other layer types. Yeah, I'm going to take over with a couple of more boring slides. So yeah, I want to talk about which type of data is supported in 3D in the scene view in the JavaScript API. First of all, most of the 2D layers are, are, are supported in 3D. So most of the layers that you know from 2D, you can add them in 3D as well. I put 2D in, in quotes because Obviously, we display them in 3D, and for example, the base map is being draped on terrain, so it kind of turns into a, a 3D layer. Uh, a feature layer actually has specific options. Uh, for example, it's called the elevation info that tells the feature layer where in the z-axis the feature should be put. So um, yeah, and, and you've already seen the GeoJSON layer in the plenary this morning uh, operating in 3D. But these are kind of the classical 2D um, uh, layer types enriched with 3D functionalities. There are some layers that are not yet supported in the scene view, uh, KML layer, MapNose layer, GeoRSS layer. We, depending on demand, we may work on those uh, in the future. So if, if there's some specific needs you have for those, let us know. Um, there's, uh, in the API reference, when you look at the reference page for layer, there's actually some big tables that tell you about all the different data types, and it, it always tells you whether, where it's supported or not. So this is uh, where you can look this kind of information up. It's actually, I noticed when I made this presentation, it's a little bit out of date, so we're going to fix that with the next uh, release. So these are layers you may or may not, already, you may already know. These are the layers that work in 2D. But we also uh, introduced a set of layers specific for 3D to address the needs of 3D and 3D only. So these layers are not supported in 2D. And they're kind of under the umbrella of what we call the scene layers. So you notice a pattern when we, uh, everything that has 3 in it is kind of called scene. It's a scene view, it's a scene layers, and so on. Um, so yeah, scene layers are, are specialized for 3D. They uh, uh, one reason why we use scene layers uh, instead of, for example, feature layers is because the back end of that, the data storage, is optimized for display in 3D. In 3D, we have to load a lot more data uh, than in 2D. And so to make that efficient and also to make that, we also have to display a lot more data than in 2D. And to make that um, efficient to download and display in a computer, we introduce these new layer types. Um, all the scene layers are based on an open data format that's called I3S. Um, 
So in case you're interested in how this data is stored, you can look into that. Uh, the main reason why we have that, or one of the reasons why we have that is to allow third party vendors to directly write that format as well. And yeah, scene layers are currently not supported in 2D. There are actually multiple subtypes of scene layers. The first one uh, we've already seen is the 3D object scene layer, which is, if you're familiar with multi patches in the desktop environment, that's kind of the, the uh, one to one correspondence. So it's, it's really, it's 3D polygonal data, 3D triangular data uh, that it displays. It can be textured or untextured. So here's a scene, um, some textured buildings but also some like stylized buildings. You can see this, this is Portland's a large number of buildings. It can be much more actually. Um, yeah, that's the basic uh, scene layer and the one you'll probably use the most. There's also a point scene layer um, that allows faster uh, transmission of, of point data. Um, then there's the new, the, the building scene layer which we just introduced in that release. Uh, if you've been in the plenary, the main reason to have that is to bring BIM data, CID, construction type data into the, into the web uh, and has some specific semantics uh, to deal with buildings. Then there's the point cloud layer. Um, so point clouds are, the point cloud data typically comes from LIDAR. So these are, these are LIDAR scans. Um, most of the time uh, if you have like, if you have LIDAR data you will want to work with this. If you don't have it, you will not. Uh, <coughs> the difference between a point scene layer and a point Sorry, the difference between a point cloud layer and another type of point layer, like point feature layer or point scene layer, is that in, in this kind of data, each individual point doesn't really, it's not an entity by itself. It's not a feature, you know. It doesn't, doesn't specify something uh, that lives on its own. It's more like part of generating a surface. So that, that's why we call it point cloud. It's really the, the uh, a number of points that make up something that makes sense, it's not each individual point. Uh, and then there's the integrated mesh scene layer, which is, uh, takes that one step further, but it's, it's also, it's a specialized type of 3D geometry for surface scans. So, uh, you can get this kind of data from vendors like Rikon or Bentley. Uh, this is a really nice data set of, uh, of Yosemite. Um, that kind of replaces the, the normal elevation surface, uh, that is kind of two and a half D height map with a full 3D surface, uh, scan of the surface. Yeah, so those are the scene layer types. Um, okay, one last word uh, on projections. Um, I'll try to be quick with this. Like, uh, there's a few things you need to consider. Uh, how to, like, which data you can load in the scene view. Scene view is essentially two modes, and this is stored in the C in the viewing mode. You can either configure that or let it figure it out itself. There's a global mode, the global scene, or the local mode, the local scene. But another way to talk about it is really there's a, a round <laughs> globe, uh, global display, and there's a flat uh, display, like planner display versus versus like uh, geoid display. And we have different sets of restrictions depending on that mode. In a global scene, your non-reprojectable data, I'll, I'll come to that, has to be in either Web Mercator or WGS84 projection. Non-reprojectable reprojectable means that if the service already supports reprojection like the feature service or uh, the uh, dynamic map service, then you can add it nevertheless because we'll ask the service to project it for us. But for services like tiled maps or scene services, scene layers, um, it has to be one of those two if you want to add it to a global scene. In a local scene, on the other hand, we support any projected coordinate system, but we, it has to be one single projected coordinate system for the entire scene. So if, if one, um, if one, let's say the, the base map is in, in Web Mercator, then all of the data has to be in Web Mercator. Or if it's in your local projection system, then you have to provide the API with, with all of that. The reason for that is we don't do RAS, we don't do complex reprojection in the client yet. We don't do RAS reprojection, we don't reproject uh, scene layers to any coordinate system. So either you, when you use a local scene, you have to use one of the coordinate systems that we know that we can reproject, or you can use a local scene, but then you have to provide all the data in the same coordinate system. Yep, so I believe we left off uh, adding uh, different layers to our view. Um, let's have a look how we can uh, visualize them a little different. So the first uh, example we had was the, the or Actually, the second one uh, was a feature layer with uh, the points. 
Um, by default, it's, it's really just added as green points on your on your scene layer. Um, if we wanted to style that a little different, it's quite simple. By um, changing the render of of the layer, um, adding uh, a simple render, uh, having a symbol which is a point symbol 3D um, containing uh, an icon symbol 3D layer, uh, where we can basically say, okay, please display this uh, icon that we have uh, in the image folder as a 3D icon in our scene. So 3D means basically if we turn around it will always render the icon so that we can see it from the front. Um, one thing you notice here is that when we tilt the view um, they're basically all shown in the same so, uh, size. So something um, that uh, specifically the, the scene view uh, uh, supports or the, the better to say the layer supports is improving the perspective by making the icons which are further away smaller than the ones that are closer. This gives, uh, gives you a little more of a, uh, a feeling of depth uh, with these icons. Um, we've also added a, um, a little bit of an offset here, uh, displaying these icons not on the ground but uh, up in the air. Uh, I think um, that that is a uh, hundred meters um, in this case if you don't provide a, um, a um, metric. Um, and the line you see here is basically this uh, line uh, call out in 3D. Um, similar to the feature layer, we can also apply a, a render to the, to the scene layer. Um, in this case, we uh, have a, a close up of the financial district of Manhattan. Um, and we can basically tell it to color the buildings in, in uh, some greenish color now <clears throat> because we're in 3D um, we do want to make use of um, other techniques to, to, to get this feeling of depth. Um, we can achieve this for example by adding edges to the, to the render so this is basically the same expression as uh, above here. The material is still the same uh, color as we have here and then we can add some solid edges uh, to, to these buildings uh, gives it a little more of a, uh, a depth. Um, besides that, um, we can also enable shadows on the scene view. Um, and this will uh, basically take the, the daytime, uh, compute where the sun is and, and uh, uh, compute where the shadows of uh, these buildings will, will fall. And uh, this certainly gives it a, a, a more realistic uh, uh, rendering. Uh, whoops. There we go. Um, so what happens if we want to combine uh, different data uh, on the same, in the same scene view? Obviously here we would have a problem because we have these, uh, these uh, uh, call outs from, from our feature layer. Now if we um, put the, 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 the scene layer back into the scene with the buildings, they would obviously cover our feature layer. Um, there's a really nice feature uh, on the feature layer, uh, which is the elevation info, where you can basically tell it to draw the icons um, relative to the scene instead of relative to the ground. And that basically means that it not only takes the elevation into account but it also takes any scene layers you have in your map and adds the height, um, the height of all the scene layers together at that point um, to the, in this case, the, the icon being rendered. And um, this allows us to basically have these uh, call outs on top of each of the buildings here um, giving us the possibility to in this case, um, display more information about uh, these specific buildings here in New York City. Um, so, uh, with this, we're we're actually almost um, we're almost having some sort of uh, app uh, to retrieve information, short, short information about buildings in in New York City. So, by the way, um, this is a very short, like. Uh, 
100 miles uh, introduction about visualization. We have a dedicated session for how to, what, all, what are all the capabilities for visualizing data in 3D. Uh, there will be a, a, a mention of that at the end of the session. So if you're more interested in, in those topics, uh, do attend that session. There will be one full hour to talk only about that. And there's a lot of capabilities that we can touch on in this session here. Just a few more words. Uh, so you've seen uh, uh, Arno assign renders and symbols, and you, you're probably familiar with these concepts. So I just want to talk a little bit about what's new or what's different when you do 3D. And first, I want to talk about what's the same, um, specifically the, the renderer types uh, and the renderer classes are actually just shared between 2D and 3D. So there's simple renderer, class back renderer, unique value render. You can use the same both in 2D and in 3D. The 2D symbols are also supported. So if you have a simple render, you could as assign your, um, your picture marker symbol or your cartographic line symbol, and we will convert them internally into the, our 3D representation. It's a bit of a lossy conversion. There's some features in 2D that we don't support, so it may not look exactly the same. Um, but yeah, but it's definitely a, a, a one way to go. We have, however, introduced a new set of symbols that are specific for 3D because 3D has all of these needs that 2D doesn't have and vice versa. So we thought that at the symbol level, it's actually worth making a distinction. And so these are the 3D symbols, point symbol 3D, line symbol 3D, polygon 3D, mesh symbol 3D. So of course, one symbol type for each um, of the geometry types that you may be working with. And what's also different uh, between 2D symbols and 3D symbols is that these 3D symbols are only containers. Um, they don't directly uh, contain a description of how things look like. Into these 3D symbols, you're going to put 3D symbol layers, and you can actually put multiple symbol layers into a, 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 a 3D symbol. Um, so we have here point line and polygon symbols, and for each of the symbols we have, or for each of the symbol types, we have two different symbol layers, and the, you can you can kind of describe it. We always have like a flat version, kind of 2D-ish. That's the top row here, and we have kind of a volumetric or 3D-ish version. So the icon symbol layer is the one you've already seen. It puts an icon into 3D, uh, but then there's the object symbol 3D layer, which allows you to put actual 3D objects into the scene. Like here, there's a cylinders, but this could also be like these GLTF models that uh, we've showed in the plenary this morning. It could be trees or, or spheres, um, these kind of things. Then on the line uh, symbol 3D, the line symbol 3D layer is what, what you would commonly expect a line to be. It's a simple line. Uh, whereas the path symbol 3D layer creates a 3D shape out of that line. And currently, the only support that we have is kind of like a tube. So it creates an extrusion or a tube along the line. We will introduce more of those uh, most likely in the next release. And then for polygons, there's fill, which simply fills the polygon with a color. And then there's the extrude symbol layer, which extrudes the polygon to a certain height. And that height can also be data driven. So you can, for example, use the, uh, if, if it's a building footprint and have, you have an attribute that tells, that, that stores the height of the building, you can automatically extrude it to the height of, of the building. Um, yeah, so again, there's uh, much more about that in the session that I will link to later. Maybe a, a quick comment, the uh, examples we've just seen, also those I think are mostly taken from, from the sandbox examples. So if, you're, if you want to see some of these uh, symbols um, being applied to, to, to maps and interacting with them, uh, I think you can um, uh, f pretty much find them all here in the, in the developer portal. Um, so back to the presentation, since uh, we are talking about interactive maps, um, Let's uh, have a look at how we can actually interact now with the data that we're displaying in our scene view. Um, the scene view class gives, gives us um, a few options. So this, these are only a few methods and fields that we have on, on the scene view class. Uh, but they are the more important ones. Um, so first of all, we have a camera. This basically specifies what our viewpoint is and uh, what we're looking at in the scene view. We're not, go we're not talking about the camera. Uh in this presentation today. Tomorrow, I will uh, describe in detail how you could interact with that camera. But the easier way to set your viewpoint is <laughs> using GoTo. Exactly. <laughs> um, we're going to have a look at that. Yeah. Um, 
go to a uh, hit test, uh, basically given a coordinates, uh, finding out what you actually have at those coordinates in your scene view. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, on, which uh, is basically allows you to register for user events uh, such as click events. Uh, we'll also have a look at that. So, first example with uh, hit test here um, is a, a small script. So, we're basically signing up for one of those uh, events. Uh, in this case, it's a click event um, on, the, on the view itself. So, the view here is the instance of scene view, an instance of scene view. And um, so basically when we click on the view, we get um, the, our function, uh, the function that we pass here, callback is, is called. Um, we then take the event and pass it directly on to the next method uh, we've seen before, which is hit test. So we can either pass uh, coordinates to hit test, we can also just pass the whole event. Um, and that one will asynchronously find out uh, what we have at at that specific position and then again um, provide a result in a, in a callback function um, here as a, as a response which then contains um, the graphics, the either, yeah, one or multiple graphics that you've, uh, you, you have at that position in the, in the screen. <laughs> um, what we do in this example here is that when we click on a building, uh, we basically then uh, use the third method we have in the scene view, which is the go to, uh, where we basically pass this graphic that hit test previously returned to us. We just pass it on to the to to the go to method as a target. We tell it to use the same scale that we currently have, um, and we also tell the go to uh, method to uh, basically uh, do this transition within three seconds. Um, and this, this gives us this nice hover effect. So when we select buildings, uh, we basically, um, so this, this, uh, this callback is being called and, and uh, we then get the building that you clicked on and we then tell the view to hover over to that specific building. There are uh, a lot more ways in which you can use GoTo, and it's really like your Swiss Army knife for defining the view. And we'll go into detail for that in the in tomorrow's session beyond the basics. I think we have uh, one more. Oh, you have one more. Yeah, sorry. So you can actually also just pass a, a hard-coded uh, camera position. Uh, in this case, we we have a, a longitude, latitude coordinates, uh, a set value, and um, uh, yeah. So basically giving it a, a different position in our scene here uh, being the skyline of New York uh, together with uh, heading and tilt this basically says uh, what the direction of the camera is that you're looking at in degrees. Um, one more example with uh, interacting with your scene view here uh, using the new building scene layer. Um, I think you'll see this building if few times among <laughs> along the presentations uh, this week. Um, so this is in Redlands, uh, very similar to the feature and scene layer we've seen before. You can instantiate the building scene layer providing a uh, portal, uh, portal item ID and adding it to your view. Um, so this is, uh, I th uh, think it's one of uh, Esri's buildings in, in Redlands. Um, uh, having, uh, yeah, different um, layers of information um, of this building. We can um, basically access these layers um, through the API. <clears throat> so we have a function here which uh, you basically give it a, a title name, uh, a, a, um, a layer name, a t title of a layer. Uh, it takes the building scene layer, uh, asks for all the sublayers in, in the building scene layer, goes through them and checks uh, or returns the one sublayer that has the same title. Um, we're making use of this uh, by basically uh, fetching um, the sublayer that has the name walls and uh, telling it to, yeah, to disappear in our 
uh, scene view. And this, uh, this way we can basically reduce the layers being displayed um, and have a, uh, an, an look inside of the building. Um, that was the walls and here we're removing uh, the roof and the windows. Um, yeah, giving us uh, basically an inside view of this, uh, of this building. So that's uh, another example how you can interact uh, with your data uh, that is being shown in the, in the scene view. Obviously there's a, a lot more uh, capabilities, uh, ways to do this. Um, I think you're covering part of that in the, in the next session. Um, and yep. I guess we're also seeing a few demo apps where this is taken a bit further. All right. Uh, last thing for today, uh, I want to talk about web scenes and the web scene is used when you want to not only build your app and let your user play with it, but if you want to load and store entire scenes. Um, and so when I showed you this diagram earlier, it was actually a bit of a simplification in many ways. But um, one thing is when I said the map is always the same for 2D and 3D and the view, the, the view um, differs. This is not 100% true. When it comes to persistence, when you want to start storing your scenes, we actually have to make a difference on the model level as well. So in that case, the map is a base class that you can use in 2D and 3D. But if you want to store your data to, or let's say your scene um, to RGS Online or, or Enterprise, then you have to use a web scene instead of map or the web scene class instead of the map. This is because the on that level, uh, on the online, on the model level in, in the persistence in online or in enterprise, uh, there's a difference between 2D and 3D. It's the web scene and the web map. And so we have to make that difference in the API as well. The, the web scene inherits all the functionality from map. So if you start out in your app working with it as a map, you can at the point that you want to save the, web, the scene uh, or the map, um, you can just turn that into a web scene object and then uh, everything should still work. So this adds persistence to that left side of the diagram. Um, again, let's contrast, I think I've said most of this probably, contrasting map versus web scene. The map works both with map view and scene view. The web scene only works with the scene view. There's the web map object which then only works with the map view. Uh, on the other hand, the map cannot be saved whereas the web scene can be saved. Let's take a very quick look at that. Um, actually, I would like this to make this a little demo. Um, I'd like to create a little scene, very simple, but th this hopefully highlights why you may want to do this in your app as well. So let's say we want to create an app and since we're in Palm Springs, let's say that our, our, um, our app is somehow focused in Palm Springs or our websites. So let's add some, so this is the scene viewer by the way, the application I've talked about before. Um, let's add some data in here so I can search here RGS online for data in Palm Springs and then you can browse the data. I, here there's this Palm Springs neighborhoods uh, feature layer uh, which shows all the neighborhoods of Palm Springs. Um, and perhaps we want a bit of a more neutral styling to that. So instead of this, uh, these colors, let's just change this to be um, like semi-transparent polygons of some other color like this. Let's remove the outline. Um, so all of this can be done very quickly in the scene view or in the API you would have to write all this code, right? Um, okay, and once we're happy with that, we can save the scene. Um, Palm Springs test. We have to give it some text. All right, let's save this. Now it's being saved to RGS Online. You can see here now, or actually let, let's look at that. So the dialog, no, you can do it here. You can click on the title here. That will take you to the uh, portal item of that scene. And similarly as with layer as Arno has shown, we have the portal item ID up here. So we can copy that portal item now. And uh, then, oops, I should make this code a little larger. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, and this is already started. Please never mind the right, right hand side for now. So you know that we instantiated the map and then a scene view. Now the difference is that now we're going to instantiate the web scene and then the scene view and we're passing that scene into the scene view. 
And instead of just instantiating an empty web scene or map, we're actually giving it that portal item ID. So I'm going to exchange that with the portal item ID of the scene that I just created. Can refresh that. Um, oh, and it needs me to sign in. Great. Let's try that. Here we go. Um, and that's a scene we just created. So this is obviously a very simple way to bootstrap your application. For all the data that's static in your app that you just need there, it's much easier to just add it in the scene viewer, style it there, save a scene, and then start out your app by loading that web scene and then putting all the interactive elements and so on um, th that, that you need and create the app around it. So a couple of words about scenes. As I said, these you can save to online or enterprise. Um, we've talked about loading so far. Uh, there's an SDK sample about saving. It's, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to authenticate and, and so on, but it's almost, almost as easy. So if you want to have uh, a workflow where you can actually change the scene in the app and then persist it, that's also possible. The app tip or the web scene persists data, but not the view or the app behavior. So you can't store your entire application that you built into the application, uh, sorry, into the web scene. Um, that's why you build an app and not just a scene. There are some exceptions, like for example, the pop up. Uh, you may be familiar with the pop up template. That's actually a property on the layer. So on the layer, you can describe what the pop up looks like. And that will be persisted in the web scene and it will look the same when you load it again. You could say that this is application behavior. And the web scene also stores, for example, the initial view of the scene and also slides. So there's some view parts in it. But mostly, I would say it persists the data, not the view and not the behavior. The web scene actually behind the scenes is a simple JSON document and it's an open specification. If you want to read the web scenes for some other application or write them, uh, you can look this up here. All right. So uh, I mentioned a few sessions throughout, uh, or we mentioned a few sessions throughout this session. Uh, here's the pointers to it. First of all, there's a kind of the second in a row, the Beyond the Basics presentation tomorrow at the same time but in a different room. If you want to learn more details about all the concepts we talked about right now, this is definitely a great session to attend. Um, I'll be part of that and then also Stefan, another colleague from Zurich. Uh, if you want to get a more sort of hands-on view on how you actually build a web application, where you get the data from and so on, there's this, uh, sorry, uh, that was confused. That's a yet another session. But uh, if you already have, if you want to learn how to turn your 2D data into 3D data, if 2D data is what you have but you want to create 3D visualizations, this is a great uh, session that talks about that. And then finally, that 3D visualization um, uh, session I've mentioned which goes into much more detail about the renderers and the symbols uh, and these things. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, I will just very briefly uh, show uh, some more cool samples of what you can do uh, in 3D and then we have time for questions, uh, uh, maybe five minutes. So this is, uh, sorry, I should have done this differently. If you look at it just statically, it looks like a painting, right? Somebody's scribbling something. But it's actually a 3D scene. It's, it's making use, it's using the, oh, it's not this is San Francisco, but it's making use of the edge rendering functionality that Arno already did but there's a different mode to it that makes it look sketchy. Um, so that's that. Uh, here's a more data visualization type uh, application. It shows the uh, population around the world um, at different uh, years. You can hover over these cylinders that you can see they will be high lit and you can see down here it's probably a bit small but in the uh, left side you can see how many the bar corresponds to. So that's kind of a different kind of legend um, that's more interactive. Uh, here's the application that Raluca, our colleague Raluca built that Arno kind of used as a basis for his samples here. It, it shows all the skyscrapers of New York. Um, you can filter them, for example, by the year in which they were built. Um, you can, ho when you hover over, uh, yeah, sh show it maybe the other way around. So now you only see the ones that have been built in the last 25 years. You can uh, click on them to get more information here on the right hand side. It'll also frame it. When you hover over the um, skyscraper, oh, okay, bad example, but when you hover over them here, they will also highlight in the view. It's a bit hard to see. You can filter them by height as well. Maybe, yeah, there we go. See only the tallest skyscrapers. 
Um, then here's another cool app done by the application prototyping lab. This shows, I wonder if you can actually see it. Uh, this shows satellites around the world um, and you can apply different filters. For example, maybe you want to see only chunk satellites, only non-chunk satellites. If you click on one, it actually shows the, tra the trajectory of that satellite. Um, and you can also filter by launch date or uh, by the orbit. And yeah, that's it. So that's just like to give you kind of like a, uh, a very big broad picture of, of what's possible. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. I would like to uh, motivate you to fill in the survey. Like uh, we are trying to give our best and give you the content that you need to know and the form that you need to know it. But um, it's very helpful if you can give us like feedback about what worked, what didn't work, so we can improve it for, for the next time. So uh, please fill in the surveys for all of the sessions you see here at Dev Summit. We really look at the, the results and, and try to uh, have that, make that an influence for the, for the next time. And that's uh, the end of what we have. We have uh, five minutes more for open questions and afterwards we'll also be available down here for you to ask questions. If you have a question, please step up to the microphones. I, I, it's fine. You can just uh, ask. So when I saw the sandbox, the API website, so is there a particular reason you put the script instead of the cat, not the body? So the question was in the sandbox, um, why we put the script tag inside the head? Is there like performance difference? No. Um, I mean, there are a few differences, like in how, when the, the script tag is loaded, but this is not, you can, you can put it in the, in the body if you want. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure, to be honest. I'm, I'm, but I think you can. So there, there, there may be other reasons why you would, would want to put it here or there. You know what? Let's just give it a try. Yeah. You tried? Yeah. All right. So uh, there, I mean, there's, I, 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 the details escape me, but, but there's some, like different behavior depending on whether you put it in HTML, in head or body. Um, if you look those up, there may be reasons why you want to do it like this or like that in the app, but not for performance reasons of the API itself. The loading may be a bit different, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that points we can use in scene layer. Does yes. Does that include a client side main layer? Sorry, could you ask again the second uh, one? Yeah, so if I'm creating one from the client side, You mean? So I haven't found where to, to add uh, the attributes or, or the graphs. So the, the point scene layer is um, it's really something that the only way to create it currently is when you publish something from ArcGIS Pro. Okay, so, um, so this is really like when you have a large data set. I would say like a feature wor layer works perfectly fine if you have a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand points. If you have hundreds of thousands of points, then we have, we can display it faster if you actually publish it as a scene layer, but for that you have to load it into ArcGIS Pro and publish it to ArcGIS Online like that. Uh, other than that, the scene layer, the point scene layer works almost the same as a point feature layer. You can apply the same renderers, the, the same elevation info. So in terms of behavior, there is no difference. Uh, well, in terms of, in terms, yeah, it's just performance, exactly. But what if we're talking about 50,000 or 60,000 points? Works okay-ish with a feature layer, try it out yourself. Like if you're unhappy with the performance, give the, the point scene layer a spin. So this is, I would say 50,000 points is probably kind of the barrier where it starts to make, uh, starts to make a difference. But it also depends, um, uh, like, so there's, okay, sorry, there's one big difference between point feature layers and point scene layers. On the point feature layer, you can make server side um, filtering. So you can say, you can put the definition expression, say I'm only interested in that set of points, for example. Um, the, the scene layer doesn't allow for that. You can still filter it on the client side, but we will always download all the data. Um, so then depending on what you're doing, that may still be a good reason to use a feature layer. Uh, but yeah. Can, yeah. Can both be uh, rendered with the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of symbology, there really is no difference uh, between the scene layers and the feature layers. By the way, there's also if you if you try them out, you look at them side by side, they kind of exhibit a different loading pattern. You may like one better than the other, but this is more of a technical reason. This is 
in the way that the data is stored that create that makes them appear a little differently. So for the one population sample. Yes. Yeah, this is um, multiple feature layers. I think I think so too. I'm actually not. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's not a time-enabled layer, and it's either different layers or it's. Nah, I think it's different layers. It's in different that layers. Case. In that so, yeah. We don't have time support yet in uh, in 3D, or I think in 4X in general, or very limited. This is the one thing that we or one of the things we want to work on in the very near future. So that will come. Yes, another question. So, uh, just briefly, what, what's the process for adding in your own um, terrain and imagery? Is it just a matter of putting it up as a portal or online? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You load your um, your data your raster data set in ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap, you publish it to online, and then there's actually a, a separate layer type. Um, I don't know if it's oh, here we go. There's a separate layer type, it's called elevation layer. Oops. And um, you add that elevation layer not into into the map directly, but into the ground object of the map. That describes your ground surface. Um, and in there you add that elevation layer, and that will make the, it appear then. You can add multiple elevation layers in there. So for example, you can have the, the as we provided one as kind of a base map layer, and then for your city or your area of interest, you add a second layer on top, and then wherever your layer has data, that will be displayed, and wherever your layer doesn't have data, we will use kind of as a fallback the, the global layer. It's um just wondering, because we have my use case is sort of a quarter of all of Australia. Yeah. Um, so I would have to go a little bit um out on thin ice for that. I'm not 100% sure if I would describe it correctly. So uh, if you could please uh, go to the guys at the 3D island in the show floor, they will know exactly how to uh, process that data and publish it um, to online. All right, so um, we're wrapping up the session here. As I said, we'll be down here. If you have any more questions, please just approach us. Thanks very much for sticking around.